Dear President of the ESDR, dear members of the LEO Foundation, dear Maria, congratulations on a well-achieved and well-deserved award. It was a great talk, great pleasure to listen to you. Dear friends and dear colleagues, it's of course an outstanding honor for me to receive the Silver Award of this year. I'm humbled by it and I, I would have never thought that I would ever stand on this stage uh, 10 years ago. But um, some of you might think, think when they read my title, maybe they gave this award to the wrong guy. He doesn't even know how to write. He's same, same, but different, same twice. What does he mean? And well, I can comment on the selection of myself as the award winner, but I can at least try and give you an explanation for the selection of my title. And uh, the selection of my title is based on this idiomatic phrase, same, same, but different, is something that you hear in Southeast Asia and it's used to describe basic similarity between two things with a slight touch of ambiguity. So to give you an example, you walk down the street, you walk up to a street vendor, and he will offer you a watch. He says, this is a Rolex, give me 10 bucks. You look at the watch, this is really handmade Swiss watch for $10? He says, yeah, it's same, same, but different. So, I would like to convince you now in the coming minutes that TH9 cells and TH2 cells are basically same, same, but different. And let me start my line of arguments with an introduction into the family of T helper cells. So when a naive T cell is polarized, you know it can be polarized into distinct subsets. And all of these subsets can be basically defined by four properties. Number one, the cytokines that are required to induce this polarization. Number two, the cytokines that then these cells by themselves express. So for, in, for instance, Th1 cells are differentiated under the influence of IL-12 and then express interferon gamma. Then uh, work by Federica Salusta has shown that these cells also express uh, certain chemokine receptors. So for instance, Th17 cells all reside within the CCR6 positive population. And finally, very importantly, these cells are uh, orchestrated on the genetic level by so-called master gene uh, regulators, which are transcri transcription factors that orchestrate and, and stabilize the phenotype. All of these cells also have distinct target cells through which they exert distinct function in health and disease. Now, roughly 10 years ago, two groups published uh, two papers claiming that there is a novel subset of T helper cells which was called Th9 cells because they produce IL-9 and at the time point of IL-9 production, they lack co-production of other subset defining cytokines. But before these cells can actually be called a, a, a true lineage, I would argue that we have to do some more homework. We would have to define what their chemokine receptor profile is, what the transcriptional regulation exactly is of these cells, and also, of course, especially in the human system, how do they work and what do they contribute to? So there's a whole bunch of work in mice showing that these Th9 cells have spectacular functions, especially as pathogenic cells in allergy. And also um, my colleagues and, and I and other groups were able to show so, some work that these cells appear to be important for tumor immunity, but all of these findings are very hard to con, uh, confirm in the human system. So the problem with Th9 cells when you work in the human system, as we do, is you take a memory T cell, you can take it from any kind of tissue that you want, you can take any kind of differentiation status, and you do your facts or whatever analysis, and you don't see any IL-9. For those in the room who ever tried, they share my pain. It's not so easy to measure IL-9 producing Th9 uh, T cells. The, the trick is to actually stimulate these cells and then do your analysis very, very shortly thereafter. As you can see, very early after activation, there is a population of, cell, of cells that upregulates IL-9, and this IL-9 production in these cells is then very quickly downregulated again, and as early as six days after activation, this population is gone again, and especially in the resting state, state these cells won't produce IL-9. However, at the time point where they really produce the IL-9, you can do co-expression analysis and they do show a Th9 phenotype, meaning they don't express any other lineage-defining cytokines at that time. And they are unique, uh, not only by their expression of IL-9, but they also sh show unique uh, expression kinetics, as you can see here on the bottom right. These cells express IL-9 very quickly, it's quickly downregulated, 
post-activation. And this is in, in, in clear contrast to how other cytokines are regulated in T cells, as you can see here. Now, this brought us to the basic, this is the existential question of Th9 cells. It's the same question as we humans ask ourselves, where do we come from and where do we go to? And where do these cells that upregulate IL-9 transiently come from? What are they before they produce IL-9? And what do they become? And basically, basically, you can hypothesize it's either a new subset, of course, that's the sexy interpretation, but you could also say, well, well, say, well, we, well maybe this is a subset we already know that just changes the phenotype transiently. Or you could also say it's an intermediate, uh, it's an intermediate state of differentiation. These cells go through this phenotype before they become something else. And the first thing we had to check to do our analysis is to see whether this transient expression of IL-9 is actually inducible repetitively, and this seems to be the case. You can repetitively stimulate these cells and they will continue to up and down regulate IL-9 after mul multiple rounds of activation. And when you look at the differentiation state, you will find that all T cells that are, uh, have the ability to upregulate IL-9 post-activation actually reside in the effector memory T cell pool, and within the effector memory T cell pool, they are CD27 negative. So this is consistent with a very terminally differentiated phenotype. So this basically set the stage for our analysis of all these defining properties of the helper cell subsets, as I already mentioned. We wanted to see what is the cytokine profile, what is the surface phenotype, what is the transcriptional regulation of these cells, and also we wanted to have a closer look at how these cells are differentiated. And of course, again, the Swiss watch, this all has to be, be done in a time and activation independent manner because it's a transient phenotype. So we started with the surface phenotype. And as you can see here, by sorting positive and negative population of memory T cells for all these different chemokine receptors that are expressed on T cells, we were able to find that actually CCR4 and CCR8 best enriches for IL-9 producing T cells. And when you do co-expression analysis in these memory T cells, you see that the CCR8 positive population is actually a subpopulation of the CCR4 positive population and that they contain the vast majority of the IL-9 producing cells. So when you compare this CCR4, CCR8 positive chemokine receptor profile with the chemokine receptor profile that has already been characterized for the other subsets, you will have to come to the conclusion that Th9 and Th2 is kind of same, same, but different. So next, this gave us the opportunity, because we had something on the surface of these cells, to do other uh, different kinds of experiments, one of which was to do single cell T cell cloning. And when you generate T cell, single uh, T cell clones from these different populations that we sort based on the chemokine receptor profile, you can see again there's not that much IL-9 production in a resting T cell. However, stimulated clones generated from the CCR8 um, positive fraction actually contain uh, the vast majority of the IL-9 producing T cells. Interestingly enough, when you look at these clones in the resting state, they are high producers of IL-5 and IL-13, even higher than classical or conventional Th2 cells are. Another way of looking at that, every dot here represents a single T cell clone, is by plotting the IL-9 expression post-activation here on the x-axis, versus the resting uh, cytokine profile on the y-axis. And you can really see all T cells that have the ability to upregulate IL-9 will also express Th2 cytokines, such as IL-13 in the resting state. Th17 cells don't do it, Th1 cells don't do it. But didn't I just show you initially there is such a thing as a Th9 phenotype? And didn't I claim they were not expressing other cytokines? Well, this is probably uh, the result of the reciprocal regulation of IL-9 and the conventional Th2 cytokines, as you can see here. So you have this uh, classical Th2 clone. It expresses high amounts of IL-13 in the resting state. When you stimulate these cells, they will downregulate Th2 cytokines, upregulate IL-9, and this gives rise to a Th9 phenotype. However, very shortly thereafter, this uh, phenotypic switch goes back and you will end up with a cell that expresses IL-13 and virtually no IL-9. So when you look at the cytokine profile in an activation and time independent manner of these cells, you will, you will find that these cells express high amounts of IL-5 and 13. And you will have to say, well, 
TH9, TH2, it's kind of si same, same, but different. So then we thought, okay, the gold standard for the characterization of IL-9 cells, uh, TH9 cells, was still to do the in vitro polarization in the presence of TGF beta and IL-4. So we wanted to have a close look at what happens during this TH9 polarization. And to make a very long story short, the, the bottom line is, yes, TH9 uh, polarization induces IL-9 in T cells, but what you eventually end up with is a T cell that produces high amounts of IL-5 and high amounts of IL-13. Uh, IL and even in these artificially primed cells, and when we started to look at transcription factors, we didn't find any discernible difference in terms of GATA3 expression between TH9 polarized cells and TH2 polarized cells. And even on the single cell level, all cells under these artificial uh, priming conditions that upregulate IL-9 express the TH2 defining transcription factor GATA3, as you can see here on the bottom right. So again, if TH9 polarization induces IL-9, yes, but also IL-4 and IL-13. And if it induces GATA3, and GATA3 is the TH2 defining transcription factor, then I would say TH9 and TH2, same, same, but different. But what does that mean, but different? What am I talking about? They are the same, aren't they? Well, one cell type has the ability to upregulate IL-9, the other one doesn't. So we took, again, we took advantage of our clones to ask what else do they uh, express differentially, these two cell types. So we took clones that react with IL-9 production to activation and compared them to other clones that are, in terms of Th2 cytokine expression, exactly the same, but they do not upregulate uh, IL-9 post-activation. And also we took a few Th1 clones, and then we performed transcriptome analysis at various time points post-activation in order to see whether there are genes that are expressed already in the resting state that kind of mediate the ability, the ability of a cell to upregulate IL-9. And what you then get is this beautiful Milky Way of correlations of genes. And on the top right, you have the genes that highly correlate in the resting state with the ability of a cell to upregulate IL-9 as a consequence of activation. On the bottom left, you have those who do uh, correlate inversely. And the outlier on the top right, as you can see here, was PPR gamma. Quite a uh, fascinating and unexpected finding. So PPR gamma is known to all of us because of its uh, role in uh, metabolism and also adipogenesis. It's this ligand activation, uh, activated transcription factor that um, induces the expression of a network of genes that is well known to regulate lipid and glucose homeostasis and so forth. But very recently, really about at the same time that we gathered these information or these data about PPR gamma in our cells, two papers came out describing PPR gamma in CD4 T cells in mice. And as it turns out, if you knock out PPR gamma in T helper cells, these mice become more or less protected from allergic lung inflammation. And when you look at these cells, where the defect is, they are having trouble producing IL-5 and IL-13. And shortly thereafter, Eric Vampre and his, friend, and his colleagues uh, uh, presented the paper where they showed that all allergen-specific T cells in humans reside in a specific subpopulation of Th2 cells, which they term Th2A cells. And when you look at the cytokine profile of these cells, you guessed it, what do they produce? They produce high amounts of IL-5 and IL-9. And of course, they also did transcriptome analysis. And what did they find? They found that PPR gamma is actually fairly specific, specifically expressed by these cells. Now, our working hypothesis at the moment is, so they are same, same in many ways, but they are also different Th2 and Th9 cells. And we believe that these cells that have been described as novel subset of Th9 cells are actually a subpopulation of Th2 cells that correspond to this recently described uh, pathogenic subpopulation of Th2 L A cells. And this is because they share their differentiation status, they share their cytokine profile, and apparently they also express, both of them, PPR gamma. So to, to test whether PPR gamma really drives IL-9 expression, we went back to the differentiation 
experiments. And this is just to show you how very nicely PPR gamma expression at the resting state correlates with the uh, ability to upregulate IL-9 uh, of a T cell. So we did T cell polarization experiments again, comparing Th2 to Th9 polarization, so IL-4 plus minus TGF beta. And you can see, yes, Th2 polarization induces uh, PPR gamma, as it has been shown. But if you add TGF beta, you get much more uh, PPR gamma early during differentiation, and it appears to stabilize this PPR gamma expression later during uh, differentiation, as you can see at day seven. So then we went to do some functional analysis on PPR gamma, and we used this GW9662, which is a very specific antagonist of PPR gamma, and checked whether Th1 or Th17 cells would care if you took them took away their PPR gamma signaling, and as you can see here, they don't care for it, as, as they shouldn't, because Th1 cells don't express PPR gamma, Th17 cells express intermediate levels. However, IL-9 expression is uh, uh, drastically reduced if you take away PPR gamma signaling in these cells, and this is true in clones, as well as in vitro, and also in vivo prime T cells. And very strikingly, other cytokines in these cells do not seem to be affected, so IL-5 production in these uh, cells, and also IL-13 production, in our hands at least, wasn't really strongly affected by the concentrations of uh, PPR gamma antagonists that we used. So I think that the thing that makes them different, or the best markers so far that we were able to identify that makes Th9 cells or IL-9 producing Th2 cells different from classical Th2 cells is the transcription factor PPR gamma, and we were able to show that it, is drive, that it drives IL-9 expression in these cells. So basically we were finished with our a characterization of these Th9 cells, but eventually, of course, you want to go into the human patient and see whether these cells play a role in the human system. And of course, because these cells have a skin homing phenotype and because we are dermatologists, we looked at acute allergic skin inflammation. And it turns out to be the case, the more acute and the more type 2 inflammation is in the skin, the more of these IL-9 producing T cells you will find. And if you check for PPR gamma expression in these uh, diseases, you will see again there's a very nice correlation between IL-9 production and PPR gamma expression. Of course, PPR gamma is expressed by, by a whole variety of different cells in the skin. To verify whether this PPR gamma really comes from the T cells, we did immunohistochemistry, and as you can see, yes, there are a whole bunch of different cells that have PPR gamma expression in their nucleus, but when you look at the infiltrating cells, there are quite a few cells that express CD4 and CD3, and therefore can be considered T helper cells that express PPR gamma in these acute inflammatory skin diseases of type 2 mediated skin diseases. So our current hypothesis, or our working hypothesis, is that Th9 cells are better described as a subpopulation of Th2 cells. They do produce IL-9, but this is only transient, and when they downregulate IL-9 production, they are actually uh, consistent with a pathogenic phenotype of Th2 cells. These cells are skin tropic, and they likely also contribute to the uh, skin resident memory phenotype and skin resident memory population, since both uh, TGF beta and ligands of PPR gamma have been shown to be key for the mediation and longevity of skin resident uh, T cells. If you activate these cells, they will, will remember their Th9 phenotype, but this will wane again very quickly. And now what we're working on at the moment is to understand what does this mean functionally in the humans, how do these uh, very shortly, uh, these cells that are present very shortly in, in, in acute inflammation, how do they med mediate allergic inflammation, and how can we maybe target them for therapeutic use. And with that, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. I would like to thank Claire Mikose, who has done most of the work that you've, uh, you've seen. And I would also like to thank the chair of our department, Luca Boradori, who has been a great source of support over the many years. Then I would like to further thank, of course, Thomas Copper and Rachel Clark for giving me the opportunity to do this exciting postdoc in their department.
I would like to thank Federica Salusto and also Christina Selinski. She's obviously no longer in Bellinzona, but at the time when she taught me all that I know about T helper cells, she was at the IRB in Bellinzona. And of course, I would also like to thank my German and Swiss collaborators, uh, Kurdin Konrad, who has been very supportive over the years, and I'm very thankful for that. And of course, Leo Pharma, thank you for that excellent dinner last night and all the other foundations that support us. Thank you very much. <laughs>